Hello, everybody. Welcome to this tech meetup. I hope everybody is well. It is a great honor to be here today and to give you this course. Thanks, Mariska, for giving me this opportunity. Um, my name is Katja Schuitemaker. Originally, I am a systems engineer. And after earning my master's, I decided to continue doing research in the form of a PhD. That PhD was about modeling complex flows in risk assessment. I have a broad interest for technology and complexity, which made me decide to delve into the, for me, rather unknown world of IT. So I decided to apply for a traineeship and then applied with ING. At the moment, I'm working as a dev engineer for ING wholesale banking. Uh, payments channels as a dev engineer. And um, yeah, one of the things I learned from my transition to IT is that if you want to become a great engineer, automata theory is actually an essential topic to study. So yeah, maybe you're wondering why AT, automata theory, is an essential topic. Why is it important to understand? Well, when I made my transition, I soon came to find out that AT explains the main basic concepts on the theory of computation, or in other words, problems that can be solved by an algorithm. And this is something that we do most of the time in IT, if not in life, because actually AT is not only about understanding how a computer works, but it is also about understanding how the world around us is evolving from one state to the next. So I decided to study AT and found out about the state of the art. Then I was wondering if ING also implemented AT. Plus, it would be nice to see if there was some AT in practice. So I started my search and in the end I found three implementations, which I'm going to show you later on. Now, during this meetup, I will provide you with a lot of information. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, Please correct me if I'm wrong, Marianne, but they are uh, possible. It's possible to put them in the chat in Teams, but also in YouTube. Correct. So, um, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. And uh, so there will be two exercises during this meetup where I'm going to ask something from your side, um, but also put, the answer, put your questions in the chat and then we will discuss them at the end of the presentation. So, with regard to today's agenda, I would like to start with the theoretical fresh up. I'm assuming that there are people that have never heard of automata theory, but for the ones that have heard of it, and I'm looking at people that studied computer science, I think it's a good idea to freshen up your knowledge. We will end this section with a small exercise. Now, after this, I will show you the examples I found within ING and demo one of them. And in the third part, I will give you an example that you might use for your own benefit using Automata for programming your own stock portfolio. So, as I said, some of you might have studied Automata theory in university. Words that might sound familiar to you and that are often mentioned in same line are finite state machines, cellular automata, artificial intelligence or machine learning, Turing machines or regex expressions. Now, mainly this buzzword artificial intelligence machine learning, I want to go into a little bit more in depth about this because they are after uh, intertwined. Um, the difference between the two. So AI ML make use of patterns. So it learns from the data itself and it adjusts. That means that it includes non-repetitive tasks. Each task can be different depending on the data that is being used. Examples can be image recognition, speech recognition, or streaming recommendations. Then automata theory is different in the sense that it runs by itself by fixed rules, meaning 
there is no memory. Every transition of state is a new situation. So we do not look at the past to make up whatever the new state will be. There are repetitive tasks and examples are a CPU, a vending machine, or for example, a self-driving car system. Now you can imagine, if the future constantly changes, both machine learning and artificial intelligence won't be very useful, right? Because they both, by definition, work off the assumption that a pattern exists. Now, why the term automata? Automata is derived from the Greek word automata, which actually means self-acting. And its visualization looks like this. Here we have the first node, state zero. We have a second node, state one. A starting state is indicated by an incoming arrow that, that does not have a source, this one. The arrows, for example, this one, indicates a transition function. So for example, if we are in state zero, we execute an A, we go to state one. If we execute a B in state one, we stay in state one. And if we execute an A in state one, we ex if we execute an, state, an A in state one, we go back to state zero. A final state is indicated by a double circle around the node. And if the nodes have a finite number of states, we call it a finite state machine or finite automaton. Now this we call a transition graph. A finite state machine is visualized a bit different, but they are alike. So for example, we have a state asleep. When we execute wake up, we are in the state awake. If we execute an eat, for example, we stay in the state awake. And if we execute then a fall asleep, we will be in the state asleep again. So as you can see, they're kind of similar, only transition graphs make use of uh, arrows without sources. They make use of double circles to indicate final state, but they are alike. Now you can compare this with an optimized if else statement that A either accepts an event to test to go to the next state, like an optimized flowchart, or B, outputs true or false after testing the input against an automaton, like a regex. Now, I am sure that almost all of you are already implementing AT or state machines in your daily work, but maybe not so explicitly as I'm showing you here. Probably some of you have encountered situations where you had to combine maybe more than 10 APIs or multiple applications that needed to align to enable the right outcome. Maybe you've experienced those flows as a spaghetti of data and code. In such cases, visualizing this complexity in transition graphs could really help to structure your flows. Automata, or in full cellular automata, can be applied in various areas to model the process in physical, chemical, biological systems, and computer science. Some examples are the effects of COVID intervention strategies or financial market fluctuations, but also, for example, constructing pseudo-random number generators and to design error correction codes in cryptography. Another example of a cellular automaton is what you're actually looking at right now, the CPU of your computer. There are many more, but not for now to explain. Okay, so now that we know how it looks like and what it is used for, maybe you are wondering how it works. A cellular automaton consists of a grid of cells. Each of these cells have their own initial state, for example, a one or a zero. A neighborhood consists of all of these cells, including their initial state. So each cell, as you can see here, for example, this cell has one neighbor with state one, one neighbor with state zero. And this total we call a neighborhood. Now, to determine what will be the state of the cell, we look at the current state of the neighborhood. 
So each step in time, the next state will be calculated by that initial state. So then you can also, it makes sense that there is no memory necessary because we're looking at, at each situation separately, right? Um, yeah. The definition of uh, cellular automata says that it is a collection of cells on a grid of specified shape that evolves over time according to a set of rules driven by the state of the neighboring cells. Now, the example I showed you before, this one, it has only two neighbors. So each cell has only one neighbor to the left, one neighbor to the right. Most common neighbor youth used are the von Neumann neighborhood, which consists of four neighbors. And the mathematical model would look like this. So we start with an index of i and j times l, which is the average cycle length over time t, equals the three by three matrix of the cell, including the state of the four neighbors. Or in case of another commonly used neighborhood, the more neighborhood, which has eight neighbors. So again, depending on the current state of the cell and the cells, the states of the cell's neighbors, the cell will be one or zero, whatever the rules tell you. Now let's look at how the pseudocode of a simple 1D automaton would look like. So we have here a current pattern, 110, 111, 011. This means that there are two to the times three, eight local states. As a result, this cellular automaton can be described by a table specifying the state a cell will have in the next generation based on the value of the cell to its left, the cell itself, and the cell to its right. Now, let's look at an example of the pseudocode. We loop over the array. We look at the cell itself. We look at the left neighbor, j minus one, and we look at the right neighbor, j plus one. If the key is one, if the left neighbor is one, if the right neighbor is one, the key will be zero. So this situation, the next state will be a zero, right? If the left neighbor is one and the right number is not one, the key will be one, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is how the pseudocode of a cellular automaton works. Very simple. Let's do a game. One of the best examples is Conway's Game of Life. We're going to play that game together, where we are determining if a cell will be born, if it will die, or if it will survive. Life is probably the most frequently written program in elementary computer science. The basic structure of life is a two-dimensional cellular automaton that is given a start state of any number of filled cells. So let's look at the rules. So each time step or generation switches cells on or off depending on the state of the cells that surround it. Cells are living, black, or dead, white. The rules are defined as follows. All eight of the cells surrounding the current one are checked to see if they're on or not. Any cells that are count any cells are on are counted, and this count is then used to determine what will happen to the current cell. The rules: a cell will die if the count is less than two or greater than three. A cell will survive if the count is exactly two or the count is exactly three and the current cell is on. Earth, if the current cell is off and the count is exactly three. So let's do it together. Check this first example, this grid. We are wondering what will happen to this middle cell. As you can see, it has eight neighbors. If we apply these three rules, what will happen to this cell? Can you please put your answer in the chat? I give you a few minutes to think about it. 
dead. I see death, die. That's by rule number one. Yeah, that is correct. So this cell will indeed die. Next situation, shoot. We have eight neighbors from which four are living and the current cell is dead. That, that, say that, correct? Yeah, all of you are correct, so it will die. Next situation. We have one that is alive with three living neighbors. What is happening? Survive. Yeah, great. All of you are correct. Last one. We have one dead cell and we have eight neighbors from which three of them are alive. What will happen? First, that is correct. Great. So you did your first automata exercise. I think you get the point. Now life shows you two things. The first is sensitivity to initial conditions. A tiny change in the rules can produce a huge difference in the output. The second thing life shows us is something that Darwin actually already hit upon when he was looking at life, the organic version. Complexity arises from simplicity. And there are even quantum versions of the game of life, so it's quite an interesting game. Um, so, basic automata theory shows you that simplicity can naturally generate complexity. If you Google cellular automata patterns, you will come across endless variations in outcome that are only the products of different initial states. So they can evolve into stable homogeneous end patterns, all the way up to very complex structures. Now, if you look at these vegetables on the background, Right now, they all look very healthy, don't you think? What do you think what will happen if one of them gets sick, one of them uh, gets a mold? Is it likely that all of them will go sick? What factors will decide about the outcome? Maybe one of them is more resilient, one of them is affected by more light or moisture. There's different temperatures, lack of air circulation, so, and what if it's not mold, but only a bruise? Now you can view this situation as a cellular automaton, a collection of cells that are transitioning in state, depending on their own state, on their parameters and on their neighbors. There are more examples of automata in nature. For example, there is a commonality between mollusks, ammonite fossils and pine cones. They actually grow by consecutive Fibonacci numbers. They grow by expansion by the Fibonacci sequence. Cells are dividing and grow, and they manage to do this while staying in contact with their neighbors. Now, interspecies observations also support the notion of automata theory instead of the specific and random optimization in natural selection. For example, there are striking similarities between very different organisms. So leopards and snakes have nearly identical pigmentation patterns reproducible by two-dimensional automata. And there are also some lizards that show computer-like patterns. Now a recent study in 2017 proved that lizards' color dynamics show a pattern that is being produced by cellular automata that result in color patterns. This idea is not new. Early Greek philosophers already studied pattern in nature. Plato, Pythagoras, and Pythocles all attempted to explain order in nature. With these ideas in mind, you can imagine that any biological attribute can be simulated with abstract machines and reduced to a more manageable level of simplicity. So, what can automata do for us? Well, a lot. 
and it's quite necessary. We're facing tremendous challenges. Viruses like COVID leaping from species to species, wildfires and tropical storms as a consequence of a small rise in temperature, economies in which billions of free transactions lead to concentrations of wealth, internet that is under attack, etc. Just like Stephen Wolfram said, author of A New Kind of Science, the entire universe might eventually be describable as a machine with a finite set of states and rules and a single initial condition. That statement makes you wonder, right? Is nature deterministic? Was it all predestined? Everything we're going through? Can it all be calculated? Nobel Prize winner Gerard het Hoofd, author of the Cellular Automaton Interpretation of Quantum Mechanics, argues in 2015 that there is no free will, that our fates are fixed from the Big Bang on. His model leads him to a position called super determinism, which eliminates any hope for free will. Some food for thought. Now, I have shown you what an automaton is, how it looks like, what it is used for, and into what kind of states it can evolve. I briefly mentioned that I have been searching for implementations within ING. In the end, I found three. Crosslink, Baker, and PCL. Let's start with Crosslink. Crosslink was founded in 2017 because of two reasons. One, interfaces between systems and often different interpretations of requirements cause disconnections between requirements and the software developed. Two, because of regulatory pressure, compliance requirements were being prioritized over business functionality. That led to capacity problems. There was simply not enough time to do all the work. Now, Crosslink has built a platform that digitalizes requirements and automates the end-to-end -end software development process. Let's put some examples. States can be created, activated, deactivated, and closed. In this case, closed is the final state. The arrows indicate transitions, remember? On the right, an example of a transition graph of a bank account transition. Created, booked, rejected, and both put, booked and rejected, sorry, both booked and rejected can lead to an archived state, final state, indicated with a double circle. The next example is Baker. Baker is designed by a squad named Apollo. Uh, it originated because they wanted to model becoming a client via the mobile app. That process was too complex. They were calling 10 to 20 APIs in a certain order, and Baker helps them in making orchestration logic for these APIs. It was uh, designed to facilitate flexibility, in face of changing requirements, to encapsulate the business rules in one central place, and to possibly tackle the problem of reusability described above. Now to do this, Apollo started the creation of a domain-specific language, DSL, which is used to describe the business process. From this DSL, an event-driven Petrinet representation is generated. Um, so it's open source, library developed by ING, used for modeling business flows, focuses on APIs, contains Petrinets. And I'm really sorry that I have to introduce again a buzzword, Petrinets, but again, you can compare it with the finite state machine and the transition graph that I have showed you earlier. They are all alike. Uh, you can find the complete repo on GitHub. Now, for example, a payment is made. If yes, we manufacture goods. Goods are manufactured. If no, payment is missing. I will give you a short demo in IntelliJ how this works. So here we have the Baker repo. We have sensory events that you can compare with the nodes that I have shown you earlier, the, the states. We have ingredients, for example, customer info that exists consists of a name, an address, an email, something tangible. Then we have the interactions. 
the interactions are the transition functions, the arrows that I have shown you earlier, and we have the recipe itself. So this is the one where the recipe actually is created. And if I test it, so let me add as get battery net. And I run this one. We have, let's first check the Petri net. An in finder, yes. Here we have it. As you can see, this Petri net kind of looks like the transition graph I shown you earlier, right? If I zoom out, you will see that this is kind of undoable to comprehend, especially when communicating with business. Um, for this reason, they have also created a kind of a flowchart diagram to make it more comprehensible. So here you can see again the payment made, leads to manufactured goods, good manufactured, etc. The one I shown you earlier in my presentation. Now let's obstruct this process. Let's remove a payment that is made. Let's also remove the requirement, the transition that a payment is made. Let's remove the customer info received and run it again. without payment made. So here you can see the two new generated diagrams. Let's look at the PetriNet. If I then search for payment, it is no longer there. Whilst actually here, it still was there. See, it's missing now. Let's look at the flowchart. In the original case, a payment was being made. Here we see that this is completely missing. I also removed the requirement, the transition, so that's why we don't see it anymore. For customer info, you remember I removed it as well, but it still doesn't know that it is no longer required. So that's why it's indicated in red. So kind of helpful when orchestrating a complexity of flows, right? So in Belgium, it's being used a lot to open an account, to open a debit card, to close a debit card, and in Spain, it's being used for creating a new transaction engine. Baker is suitable for any large IT company that uses client requests that must be executed. Okay, final example, PCL, the process configuration library. Um, this is developed by the squad Aurora and it's suitable for monolithic processes the traditional way in which we write our applications. But the intention is to combine simple modules to also provide solutions for dynamic processes to apply to more complexity. The difference between PCL and Baker is that Baker is based on a PetriNet network and created to visualize that network based on the recipe itself. So with Baker, you can do almost everything, but Aurora wanted something very simple with a small footprint. The second thing is, is that Baker is designed to use recipes to use the same flow. And Aurora wanted to have a way to configure process-based countries, available data, etc. cetera. Um, some steps in the process might become obsolete or not needed. And some new steps might dynamically pop up. They needed to adapt to the customer and to his answers. So 
you will do the onboarding process in PCL. And for a business service or mechanism, you can use Baker. It's like a pre-step for Baker. Simple example. Let's look at the identification and verification process. A request is created. You see that it is an initial node with this, uh, without a source. If yes, the request is viewed. If no, module is aborted. We reach a final state. Request viewed, yes. Policy called, etc., etc., etc. Blah blah blah. In the end, individual verified. Also a final node. Now, PCL is created one year ago, and it's not yet in production, but if I understand correctly, they are trying, aiming at to put it in production this month or next month in Italy for selling consumer loans. And in 2023, it's going to be applied to an onboarding process in Belgium and the Netherlands. Now let's move on to my final topic. The stock market exercise. You are attending an ING tech meetup. So I am assuming you have an interest in either banking or tech or both. If not, I'm at least assuming that you're interested in making more money. So I figured let me take an example that combines the two of them. Programming stock estimations. Now, if you have a stock portfolio, I'm assuming you read The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. If not, maybe you are investing without reading anything, but in the heart of its argument is that the intelligent investor must never forecast the future exclusively by extrapolating the past. Now, that makes it actually very suitable for automata theory, especially now since the markets are so volatile. First of all, it's very difficult to predict. There are often high periods of volatility, which have to be dealt with. Second, it's a very dynamic system where a large number of people interact and associate with each other. It includes elements such as technical experts, all kinds of behavior of companies and factories, but also psychological factors. So the movement of investors is difficult to predict as they make investment based on public and private information they receive about the market. Now we have an agent that can buy, sell or hold, right? We can have four neighbors that are all telling something. We can have eight neighbors that are telling something. But what if they are all telling us something different? One of them is advising to buy, one of them is advising to hold. How do we make a decision? If a stock market simulation based on agent interaction is a grid and any agent occupies a fixed cell, the model for investment behavior becomes a seller automaton. Parameters could be attitude, for example, defensive attitude or an enterprising attitude, short-term versus long-term, imitation factors. Uh, an imitator does not know or does not care about fundamental values. Instead, they follow the majority. When the imitation degree is close to zero, the investor's behavior is the opposite of his neighbor's behavior. In, if acting indifferent, you would omit this parameter. Third example of a parameter is the Hurst a component. It's a very simple to understand and useful and informative metric that can tell you whether the long-term behavior, the long-term memory in your time series is consistent with a random walk hypothesis. So it ranges from zero to one, and the further away from 0 0.5, the greater the impact of the memory. So if the Hearst value is less than 0 0.5, it can be considered as a sideways market. If it is more than 0 0.5, it would indicate a trending market. But what if the Hearst value is 0 0.5? Exactly. Then it would indicate a random walk or a market where a prediction of the future based on past data is impossible. And this is actually where automata theory might be really helpful. Now, there's multiple formulas available on the internet to calculate the first exponent. Um, other parameters you can think of are news factors, reliability factors, or trading power, etc. You can find a lot on the internet. 
Let's do another exercise. This is Christine. Christine is looking into buying a semiconductor stock. She's a typical short term investor. She buys and sells easily. Because of this attitude, she doesn't really check the fundamentals of the companies she's investing in that much, but rather follows the market. Actually, Christine just follows whatever Katie Wood is doing to make up her decision. And Katie Wood recently bought 60 million of semiconductor related stocks. Though there is one person Christine also values highly, her best friend Susan. Susan follows the news very closely, and Susan says she's not investing in semiconductors at the moment. The market is too volatile. Now, what can we say about this story? How many neighbors do we have? Mm, two, right? We have Susan and we have uh, Katie. How many states do we have? We didn't buy the stock yet, right? So the only thing we can do is to buy or not buy. So that means two states. What are the initial states? Well, Chrissy herself hasn't bought yet, so she's false. Katie is buying, she's true. Susan is not buying, she's false. What are the parameters? Now, from this story, you can see there are some parameters available. We have an enterprising attitude, so that means A is one, because Christine is a typical short-term investor. She buys and sells easily, means enterprising. The Hearst component is 0.5. Below, we see that the market is too volatile. And we have an imitating factor, factor of one. It says, because of this attitude, she doesn't really check the fundamentals of the company she's investing in that much, but rather follows the market. Actually, Christine just follows whatever Katie Wood is doing to make up her decision. And she follows her best friend, Susan, which she values very highly. So imitation factor, very high. She doesn't really think for herself. Now, question to you. Shoot me in the chat. Is Christine buying or not? What do you think? I see Paul says yes. Boss says yes. Someone going for a no? Or Hans is no? Maybe. <laughs> it's difficult, right? There's a lot of parameters. I wrote an example of the pseudocode, how you can structure this. Maybe it gives us a little bit more information. Now, we have a method invest. We have three parameters, attitude, Hearst component, imitation factor. We look over the array for index is zero to the end. We have Christine, we have Katie, index minus one, we have Susan index plus one. For convenience, I now, uh, well, I will now say that if the attitude will be zero, so uh, she would be a defensive, uh, she would have a defensive attitude, we would return a false. Um, so I simplified this situation. If we look at the Hearst component, what would Christine do in case the Hearst component is zero? Remember, if the Hearst component is less than 0 0.5, it can be considered as a sideways market. And because Christine is an imitator, she would not be buying in this case. 
the opposite for an H of one and an I of one. For the sake of the example, I have excluded the conditions where Christine will be an anti-imitator. Now, in case the H is not zero or one, it means the market is moving randomly. So we cannot look at the past. Let's look at the neighbors. What are they doing? If Christine would have been an anti-imitator, and we are looking into the conditions where one's attitude is enterprising, the only case where she would for sure be not be buying is in case Susan and Katie would be buying because she anti-imitates anti, anti, anti the majority. So a false, else return true. In all other cases, return true because she's an enterprising investor. Now, since Christine is an extreme imitator and she's quick to buy or sell, the only situation where she would not be buying is in case both Susan and Katie would not be buying. In all other cases, she would take the risk. Now, please note that I have omitted the if conditions where there's nuances in the imitation factor and also where hers is zero or one and the other imitation factors then one. Now in practice, software automatically connects to the broker server, downloads data from the server and analyzes market situation. The software system automatically sells and buys assets and follows the market whilst updating system parameters. You can argue that this is way too simple, that to predict an index cannot be simulated by such a program, and I think maybe you're right. But on the other hand, compare it with what you're doing now, do you think your current estimation is a reliable one? I'm not saying that this will increase your profits, but I would argue that this might help you structure your argumentation and decreases the number of mistakes you would make if done manually. Uh, I would suggest or I would advise you to have a look on the internet because there's many people that have done this before. You can find it on GitHub, for example. Um, for more information about Crosslink, you can go to crosslink.io. For more, more information about Baker, you can go to github.com. Then I would like to thank a few people who have helped me. Arda for his coaching, Drona for providing me with information about financial markets, Tim for, pro for, for providing me with information about Baker, Miguel for the process configuration library, and Viet for Crosslink. Thank you all very much. Without you, uh, I would not have come up with the content of this presentation. Um, to wrap up, ah, sorry, literature, please have a look at it after the presentation. To wrap up, uh, today I explained to you the basics of AT, that it can be explicitly applied to orchestrate your flows, to show you how to go from A to B, we try to apply it together during the game of life. When I was talking about an automaton with a finite number of states, like a zero or one, we call it a finite state machine. I showed you how ING was encountering a spaghetti of flows that makes them explicitly use finite state machines to orchestrate their flows. And we finally tried to predict Christine's buying behavior by viewing two of her reliable resources as her neighbors. So I hope to gave, I gave you some food for thought and that maybe you are later on wondering if that whatever is, it is that you're doing today, if it is actually you who is deciding to take that action or if you're just a collection of cells communicating with each other and the air that is surrounding you. Now, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I don't know if there are already questions in the chat, Marianne. Well, I just also launched, thank you Katja for this interesting story first. <laughs> so nice to have you here. Um, I just launched also the poll. I'm just looking into the questions. Um, 
I don't see any questions yet. Also not on the YouTube stream. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any question, please let us know. And please also fill in the poll that I just launched in the chat. Well, maybe one small question. So there are uh, in scope of the Spring framework, uh, there is Spring State Machine project, which also uh, supposed to be used to orchestrate uh, business logic, to orchestrate transactions across microservices. And it allows to uh, define state machine in also say just via code or even load from ML diagrams. So have you tried to experiment with that project or consider it next to uh, internal projects? And what is, if so, what is the benefits, drawbacks? So I haven't experienced with Spring. I am aware that it exists. So uh, I think the reason why ING uh, is using their own DSL was that uh, it's not always uh, feasible to use a framework. In if I understand correctly, for example, Baker uses design their own domain specific language because alternatives were not feasible for them. Um, but you're right, there are many, many tools you can use to uh, orchestrate flows. So I think uh, it's most likely that Spring can be one of them for sure. Thank you. Uh, Katja, so yes. that was uh, Alexander's questions and sorry, I thought I saw a question here. Yeah, would it be possible to share the last slide with the follow up reading material? I believe yes, right, because everything will yeah. be available online. Yeah, 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 of course. Um, oh, a few people uh, entered a wrong, entered the poll in the wrong state. <laughs> I think they meant it just the way around. That's fine, thanks. Um, and there's a question of things. Boss. Yeah. Boss has a question. Boss, maybe you would like to ask it yourself because it's a long yeah, question. Yeah, sure. So, so I was so in, 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 uh, in this uh, Baker example, for example, you, you uh, there's a uh, state transition based on payment. But in practice, uh, I guess, like if, if the payment uh, is, is done, but uh, when you check the state, it's totally different. Uh, and then uh, it will go to an unpaid state. That probably happens uh, in practice as well. But uh, then you, yeah, in practice, you should have like some number of uh, recovery st states to uh, like check the timeout or something. Or what kind of thoughts do you have on this? Yeah, I agree with you. When it comes to risk management, for sure, you would model barriers to decrease the risks. And the main, this was just a simple example of how it works. The, it, this is their public repo. I believe that I'm sure that they have modeled a lot of barriers to mitigate their risks, but I just wanted to show you their way of working. Okay, yes. yeah, and the add also in it is more simplified, of course. Yeah. Okay, thank you. The question was, any other questions? Alexander is uh, sharing something with you, I think, Katja. Yeah, I see it. Yeah. What is the advantage of using Automata in the given examples in comparison with not using them? Yeah, it's uh, a good question. Alexander, so uh, the advantage of Automata is that it completely simplifies complexity and also you eliminate memory. So uh, when there is a lot of complexity involved, uh, you try to go from state one to state two. That is the main benefit 
of using automata. You simplify it, uh, you make it structured, and uh, you make sure that any flow going from A to B will be clearly modeled. So other than with AIML, it's often very difficult to do reverse engineering to understand what's going on because it makes decisions based on data. In automata theory, uh, the rules are very clear. So it's kind of like an, uh, an if else statement. Does it answer your question, Alexander? He says yes. <laughs> yes, it does. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? Also, I don't have questions on the YouTube. Katja, so I think, oh, one more is coming. Any other open source projects that you know of that applies automata theory? For sure, there's many. If you Google or if you search on GitHub, only already for the stock estimations, there are many you can use as an example to start for your own. I think Vessel is adding something to the question of boss. Vessel, would you like to elaborate on that by yourself? Um, yeah. yeah, well, I mean, I, I typed it in the chat, so uh, unless there's a that is not clear, then so basically, uh, yeah, so in Baker, you can, uh, you, if you have an interaction, so that is something that does something, right? So call a service or something like that, then uh, you can have d different outcomes to that, right? So whether it's paid uh, or it's, uh, you know, it, it didn't go through because of some functional reason, not enough balance or something like that. So there can be different. Uh, outcomes uh, and you can model based on that and then with regards to like timeouts and things like that if there usually if there's a technical issue it can retry to do the interaction um, and you can configure like for how long you want to retry and what happens if uh, you have to retry it for so long and it still doesn't work then maybe there is some other functional outcome thank you Russell. thank you Russell. We still have five minutes left. Mariska, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I uh, no. If there are no questions anymore, then I want to no. thank you, uh, Katja, for this clear and really nice presentation. I, it was you're very welcome. interesting. <laughs> and uh, Thanks, you're welcome. And uh, thank you, Mariam, for uh, supporting me with this uh, technical. Uh, the technical things and i want to wish everybody a great evening and hope to see you on uh, in our next uh, meetup